The experts say that the primary cause of trouble among young people, where trouble exists, is caused by the lack of values of their parents. Their parents don't stand for anything. Nothing in their lives is exactly right or wrong, but rather a matter of, can you get away with it? The root of the trouble is a lack of any final authority. The parents don't tell their children what to do, but instead ask them, what do you want to do? They ask their children to make decisions they themselves are afraid or ill-equipped to make. The children thus find their worlds even more confused and fuzzy. Young people are going to disagree with their parents, especially as teenagers. They want to disagree and assert their independence of mind, just as we did. But they don't want their disagreement to fall into a swamp. They want their parents to stand for something, something they know and feel to be right. One of the most common complaints of young people today is that they wish someone would make a decision for them. They know they're not ready to make major decisions to major problems. In a survey, 80% of the young people questioned thought that adults were much too soft on juvenile delinquents. If they were given the opportunity themselves, they would mete out far rougher punishment than their more indulgent elders. A lack of parental authority is almost always found at the root of juvenile problems. As a rule, they are rootless kids from rootless families. It's said that parents no longer have long talks with the youngsters. The young people too often feel like strangers in their own homes. Young people thirst for knowledge but too often hear things of a kind that tend to break down their belief in people. I remember hearing a father gleefully report to his son about a business deal he'd just concluded. His actual words were, I stole it, and then he went on to describe in great detail how he had pulled the wool over someone's eyes and had made a large purchase for a fraction of its real value. Now, what went through his son's mind? I know what went through mine. What sort of values can a young person grow up with when he's led to believe that you're smart and clever when you can cheat someone? That the world is a jungle where only the quick and the dishonest can survive? It is, of course, nothing of the kind. And he should know, perhaps he does, that it's his father's lack of a sense of values and fitness and stature as a human being that have been responsible for his repeated setbacks in business and in his personal relationships. Our sons and daughters look to us for guidelines to which they can cling to make their ways in the world, and it's our responsibility to give them good ones. A plant will accurately reflect the soil and climate in which it was raised, and it's the same with children. Let's make sure the soil is rich and deep. Let's stand for what we know to be right and against what we know to be wrong. How many times have you had a good idea, talked about it a while, and then did nothing about it, only to find out later that someone else had made a fortune, or at least a very good thing, out of the idea you had done nothing about? This has happened to a lot of us at one time or another, I'm sure. It would be impossible, I suppose, to develop every good idea we get, but sometimes by wisely investing in someone we know, trust, and respect, we can achieve the same thing without working at it at all. In the spring of 1903, James Cousins told his sister Rosetta about an automobile business organized by a Detroit coal dealer and mechanic. Cousins said he was going to work for the company as office manager and urged his sister to invest $200. She'd never heard of this particular coal dealer and mechanic before, but she trusted her brother, but not completely, in that she didn't invest $200, but she reluctantly went along for $100 in what seemed to her logical mind as a rather harebrained venture. Cousins was sold that the idea was sound. He signed a note and managed to borrow $2,400 so that with his sister's $100, he could acquire 25 shares, about 2.5% of the company. He later continued to prove his faith in the venture by buying out some frightened investors to increase his holdings to 11.5%. In the next 16 years, Rosetta's investment of $100 brought dividends alone amounting to $95,000, and she sold her original $100 worth of stock for $260,000. Her brother's share earned him, in dividends alone, $5 million, and he finally sold his 11.5% interest to the founder of the company for $30 million. The 12 original investors gambled $28,000 between them. They took out $250 million. And the man who finally got all the stock in his company back, Henry Ford, became a billionaire. Now, 
For every story like that one, there might be thousands which didn't work out well. But you will find that following an idea you know to be sound, or at least firmly believe to be sound, through to its conclusion, can bring you a fine return on your faith, time, and money. The secret is to stay with your idea through all the ups and downs, the discouragement, which is so often a part of getting something started. Remember that if it were easy, everyone would be doing it. As Andrew Jackson once said, one man with courage makes a majority. Bernard M. Baruch said, there will always be opportunities for the well-disciplined man. When you find your one big idea, nurse it, cultivate it, stay with it until you succeed. It might take a year or 10 years, but the time will pass anyway. The important thing is to look before you jump. Don't grab the first good idea that comes along. Keep looking until you find an idea so exciting in itself that you can't sleep nights for thinking about it. When that happens, then you'll know it's the idea you've been looking for all the days of your life. But you have to look. There's a book written by Jose Ortega y Gasset titled Man and Crisis. In there is a passage which goes as follows. A great proportion of the thoughts with which we live are not thought out by us with the evidence in hand. With some shame we recognize that the greater part of the things we say we do not understand very well. And if we ask ourselves why we say them, we will observe that we say them only for this reason, that we have heard them said, that other people say them. We have abandoned ourselves to other people and we live in a state of otherness, constantly deceiving and defrauding ourselves. We're afraid of our own life, which is synonymous with solitude, and we flee from it, from its genuine reality, from the effort it demands. We hide our own selves behind the selves of other people. We disguise ourselves behind society. Well, what do you think of that? And you know why so many people talk and act like other people without thinking much about what they're doing or saying? I think there are two reasons. The first is that if they talk and act like everyone else, they feel they'll be readily accepted by others, that they won't have to run the danger of being different. And the second reason they go along with what others say and do is because they're too lazy and largely too ignorant to look the answers up for themselves. Have you ever thought how terrible it would be if you were following people who were following you? The big trouble comes from acting like people who don't know any more than we do and who in turn are acting like us. We can never get any place that way. It's all right to play follow the leader, but don't play follow the follower. Find yourself a leader to emulate, and if the guy next door happens to be the kind of a person you'd like to be someday, fine, follow him. But if he's no smarter than you are, he's nobody to act, talk, or think like, now is he? Be friends and good neighbors, but look to someone else as an example on which to pattern your life. As it was written, we have abandoned ourselves to other people, and we live in a state of otherness, constantly deceiving and defrauding ourselves. We're afraid of our own life which is synonymous with solitude, and we flee from it, from its genuine reality, from the effort it demands. We hide our own selves behind the selves of other people. We disguise ourselves behind society. You know, when you get to thinking of things like this, it's time to get off by yourself and do a little self-examining. It's time to ask yourself, just what kind of a person do I want to become? Do I want to be a carbon copy of the people up and down the block? Another faceless head bobbing on the vast sea of a kind of average limbo? Am I marking time, just waiting for time to pass? What we can and do waste is ourselves, what we could do but don't, the love we do not give, the efforts we do not make, the kindnesses we fail to bestow, and the happiness we neglect to earn. No, the waste is not time, but the things that could be ours, if only we would learn to understand why we are here. The next time you start to say something, ask yourself if you really believe it, and ask yourself, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> 